Hello and welcome to Unparliamentary Language, a podcast that will release by the 19th of July. And how are you, Rob? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I, I'm good, yeah. Um, I am very much hoping that on the 19th of July things are a bit uh, more open, but also a bit, uh, as I think we're going to discuss, feeling a bit cautious about it all, given uh, the current situation. I think we'll probably press into our headlines quite quickly, but I'm hoping to be able to go on holiday next week. Uh, I'm glad I haven't booked a hotel or anything, just in case. Um, but the rules in Scotland are a bit different and there's an empty house that belongs to a friend, so it should be fine. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't be at the moment, judging where everything's going, but I think everyone is a little concerned right now and I think we should probably press on into our headlines where we can talk about that a bit more. Yeah. So our, our first two headlines, and uh, I'm going to just mention the dates here so you can compare and contrast, from the Daily Mail on July 5th, freedom is in your hands now. And then from the Mirror on July 15th, uh, which is time of recording today, Mask Chaos. Uh, what's that all about, Rob? Yeah, so this is the news that, um, you know, COVID restrictions are coming to an end, or at least there is an opening up of things directed by the government. Um, initially, uh, Freedom Day, as it was dubbed, was meant to be on June 21st, but that was kicked down the road a little bit in order for the government to get a few more people vaccinated as it felt that it wasn't the right time to open up. Um, but it now does seem that all eyes are set on July 19th as the day that restrictions will end, in a sense. And when I say restrictions, the government has said that there will no longer be sort of like a government-enforced mask mandate to go into places. Um, the work-from-home order, the suggestion that people work from home will be sort of like loosened up, and they're going to definitely encourage people to go back to offices and the sort of the rule of six that we've got in place at the moment, that will be phased out and you can go out and see as many people as you like. You'll start to see, um, you know, nightclubs opening, that kind of thing. So this is a date that many people and importantly businesses have had in their minds for a long time as fantastic. We can start to return to normal, uh, inverted commas, around normal. Um, but I just wanted to put these two dates in context for how there's kind of been like a shift in tone with Johnson's words and the press conferences he's done. So the one that happened on when Johnson did his speech on July 5th, it was a big kind of, hey, Freedom Day is here. It's going to be on July 19th, no matter what happens. Remember me, I'm Boris Johnson. I love fun. Um, because uh, if there's one thing that Boris Johnson likes, it's to be liked. I feel. Um, and COVID restrictions and stopping people from doing what they want is very un-Johnson-esque. Um, so I think this is the day he's kind of like really been looking forward to. He can be the guy who gave everybody their freedom back. Uh, however, the response to that has kind of been muted by the general public and businesses as a, as a whole, or some businesses, some areas, where there are very real concerns about the number of COVID cases that there are and if it's actually safe to just get rid of all restrictions immediately. Um, I say this because about 50% of the public in recent polling were feeling anxious rather than excited about the prospect of Freedom Day. We've also seen statistics where uh, the number of COVID cases are going up at a fairly rapid rate. And although we mentioned last time, although cases are going up, that's not tracking with hospitalizations and deaths, even though those are going up as well, you, you would expect as there are more cases there. Um, it does seem that the vaccination is working and that's keeping the rates, you know, it, it judged against, there was always quite a strong correlation between cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Now the correlation is far lower um, because we're seeing a far lower level of hospitalizations and deaths as a result of the vaccine program. Um, the vaccine program hasn't really reached as many people as it could and there's some worry now that it's kind of like stalled as we're going into the the summertime the people who really wanted the vaccine have taken it up as early as they can but those who haven't and are lagging behind still mean that the british public haven't quite reached that level which you would require for herd immunity as you would say i don't know the exact figure but you have to get like i i don't know specifically for coronavirus itself but the general rule is it's in the high 90s i think for like measles it's 95 percent, which is we're not there yet and not on fully vaccinated people. Precisely. Um, so there are some worries that even though herd immunity is kind of what the government is going for, although nobody will say that out loud, I would say, but ultimately one way that you deal with a virus and get over it is that eventually the population reaches a herd immunity status. That is probably the inevitable end game. Um, in this in-between time, you've got people who are still very vulnerable. There are people who have been on uh, chemotherapy, for example, who have had the vaccine 
but the vaccine will only be 50% effective for them rather than 90% effective or whatever it's meant to be if you're a person who has a fully working immune system in that sense. So there are a large majority of people who are clinically vulnerable who are like, hey, this isn't Freedom Day for me. This is me being locked up inside even, even more than I was because you've got people out there taking less responsibility and I'm the one who's going to have to be shut away and the government doesn't seem to be helping me out with that. Um, there are also some other big challenges. So that, that mask chaos is a, is a really good one because the government has removed the mask mandate um, from the government's point of view, but that doesn't necessarily mean that private businesses um, will also remove it on July 19th. I think the most high profile of places like Waterstones have said that they'll keep it enforced. Um, I know at my workplace, we've already said that, you know, even though that there is a, you know, the government is encouraging people to go and go back into the office, um, our place of work says no, social distancing will remain. And that means that there won't be enough seats in the office to take me. So as far as I'm aware, I'm working from home till the foreseeable future. Well, as um, I think I shared with you earlier today, similar rules, I mean, we both work in NHS buildings. Um so it's not surprising that they wouldn't suddenly remove the restrictions uh, just because the government did. But the yeah, we we've said that not only in the NHS hospital I work in, but also at the whole university, we're not going to consider changing our rules until I think it's mid August. So I think that's going to be fairly common. Obviously, there are going to be some private companies that choose to just directly follow government advice. Um, I'm sure we can probably guess some of them uh, if we're talking high profile ones. Um, I don't want to like, you know, dunk on particular companies here, but I think we can probably guess a few uh, alcohol based establishments that might suddenly change their their minds on this. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think we, we we'll just have to wait and see. But I, I get the impression most businesses are not going to suddenly go to it. But I do think I'm slightly worried about at the moment you can say, well, it's the law, put, put a mask on. And if someone complains, then they're like, you know, they're, they're wrong, essentially, at the end of the day. You, can, you you could ask a police officer to come over and deal with that, for example, because they're technically breaking the law. Um, but I do wonder what it's going to be like for private businesses dealing with people. Uh, I mean, it's been bad enough when mask mandates have been in place to see people walk into certain shops and say, oh, I'm not wearing a mask. And they will get challenged by the store owner and the store owner is like, look, go away. Um, and people will, you know, kick up a fuss. I can only imagine that will be worse in the coming week. Yes. And there has been concerns from um, unions, particularly transport unions, because um, as the government has said, hey, you don't have to wear masks anymore. It's not going to be mandated by us. Some metro mayors, particularly like those in the city that tend to be Labour, have said, no, but we will enforce masks on public transport in the city, for example. And we will try and have COVID enforcement officers out there to make sure people are wearing masks on public transport, which is, yeah, they're going to enforce it. But it does mean that the Conservatives aren't seen as the bad guys from the people who don't want to wear masks point of view. Um, it will be Labour who's taking on that responsibility. And again, how do you enforce that? I mean, that's been that's been the question since the start of all of this, wasn't it? That there is a great degree of public responsibility that needs to happen, be it mandated by the government or not. Um, but now the government is really putting the stress on its the up in the public's minds to use their best judgment um, when it comes to what they do around um, coronavirus and social distancing etc um so yeah there is that's why you had june 5th that was very open up and then the speech he did recently i think it was july 12th kind of stepped that back because i feel that he went oh some people really aren't ready for us and we need some clarification on the rules but this mask issue is a particular one where there is real confusion now the government hasn't said it's mandatory there's a hodgepodge of places where, well, I need a mask in here. Well, I need it there. I'm probably going to still have to take a mask out with me in my pocket because some places will enforce it and some won't. But that will be the the general public. It's far less clear. And as we've again, as we've talked about in the past, when those COVID rules were like stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives, everybody could do that. But when it becomes don't stay at home, go out a bit, but maybe don't and go to work and don't go to work. That that great um, Matt Lucas sketch of Boris Johnson doing that back and forth. We've fallen back into that territory now. Um, the last thing that I really wanted to point out on this, and it was brought up in the Financial Times today um, and was one of the big news stories that was on BBC, um, over half a million people, 500,000 people have now been pinged by the Track and Trace app. Um, because cases are going up so fast. I mean, I was due to meet up with some friends for the first time in nearly two years at this point uh, tomorrow, 
and they just sent me a message being like screenshot of the app and I was like well fair enough uh, I suppose I have to find something to do with my Friday evening um, but yeah I mean it's happened to several close friends of mine kind of impressed it hasn't happened to me considering I'm in the hospital every day but I suppose you know the thing is we're in like a separate wing uh, of the building we're, you know I'm not on a ward I'm not a medical doctor so it's a very different situation to uh, members of NHS staff um, so yeah, it, it it has been apparent, I think, because I've been very fortunate, you know, in the early waves, like all of my friends basically locked themselves away, as told by the government. And we, we you know, we didn't really encounter any of that stuff. Um, and I think us being in that slightly younger age category, you know, we we're also, while some of us were fortunate to get the vaccine fairly early because of our work, um, you know, it's not like we were going and meeting up as groups uh, with our friends. So they, I've seen very little of this uh, self-isolating business until recently. And I think that makes you realise how big of an effect it is, I think. Yeah. And the uh, the financial times point was not only that you're like people suddenly get pinged and they can't meet up for social edu- social occasions or go to the sports game they were going to, um, but it has a big effect on the economy because you've got half a million people who have to isolate and take a week off work, essentially, that have to stay in their homes. And that will ruin plans, that will ruin schedules, that will leave places is understaffed maybe they can't take on as many customers this week because half their workforce is self-isolating and if we're going forward and things are only going to open up more after July 19th businesses would have been hoping that business would boom as more people are desperate to go outside but if people are going outside and mixing more and the virus is spreading and more apps are pinging which means more people have to stay inside anyway to self-isolate then it's kind of self-defeating in that sense you'll do as much damage to the economy by forcing everyone to self-isolate as you would trying to yeah lock everybody away in the first place or at least how do you balance that so I think the government has a real challenge there and there were questions put to Robert Jenrick today, the housing minister who wasn't quite able to answer about if those rules would be reviewed, self-isolation rules. Um, I mean, I can see them, see them staying in place because those were put in place because scientifically, if you've been in contact, you might have the virus. There's an incubation period for the virus. It's safer for you to stay inside so it doesn't spread. But yeah, I think there are more challenges on the horizon for this government, even if it's not around the death rate or hospitalization rate. Certainly the number of cases and the amount of people getting pinged, that effect will definitely have an effect um, in the weeks and months going forward. So it'll be yeah interesting to see what action the government is forced into. And I know Johnson has said no more lockdowns after July 19th, but I don't think, well, I think any sensible person will realise that we haven't seen the entire end of COVID restrictions by any means, shape or form. They're not all going away on July 19th. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what waves of restrictions happen in the in the near to mid future yeah and i think i just want to add on to that i think it's telling that the government wording went from being there will be no uh going back on this it changed that wording from this is this is it we're never going to go back to a kind of more oh well we're you know we're paying attention to what's going on kind of phrasing and i think that does suggest that they've at least convinced because when i first heard that i was like i mean well what if the pandemic gets worse you know what if there's some weird variant that the vaccines don't account for there must be a system under which you can go back on it and having politically said there's no way we're going back on it you're going to have to need to dig yourself out of that and i think they're already laying the groundwork for the possibility of having to lock down again probably in i would imagine late autumn if 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 we aren't able to get on top of it by then but we'll see we'll see so next up penalty curse denies england their dream from the Times, and Up Your Game from the Metro. I think most people can probably guess what this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is the conflation of a few stories that I've put together. But yeah, um, first of all, football didn't come home, despite us saying it once or twice. Um, you might have heard of it around. Um, it was a valiant F by our boys, as I believe I'm contractually obliged to call them. Um, yeah, it was fun, you know, like just let the football nerd out of me a little bit it was great as being an England fan who has supported them ever since I think I I half remember Euro 96 but I definitely remember France 98 and having seen and expected my country to go out in the quarterfinals or the first knockout stages to see them get to a major final was a great feeling overall and to get so close even though we ended up losing it in the end um essentially missing three penalties in the penalty shootout um to get so far um was a great achievement and i think it's been it's been telling how the nation has rallied around those people particularly those three 
um, lads who missed their penalties, Jaden Sancho, Marcus Rashford, and uh, oh, Sacco. Can't remember his first name. Apologise on that one. Um, however, you know, in the past, those players might have been, you know, uh, victimised. You know, Southgate felt like, you know, our own England manager was a person who missed the penalty in 1996, and he felt that he'd had that on his back since then. Um, so to have it with these lads and for the reaction to be so positive was really good. But that kind of positive reaction only happened because there was a great negative reaction on Twitter as well. Um, unfortunate allegations of, well, not allegations, but proof of racist comments being thrown at these three, abuse being thrown at them, which is, you know, totally unacceptable. And you saw uh, the government come out and say, yeah, yeah, no, racism's bad and stuff, and you shouldn't do this. Uh, however, I think that this tournament has been really interesting from a politics point of view. Like, sorry, I, I hate to read too much into this because there are a lot of people who are just enjoying the football for football's sake, and they don't care about the politics side of it. But for me, this England team and what Gareth Southgate had to deal with at, at the start, there was, this England football team has taken the knee. They decided they would do do it since their friendlies before and it was a point of contention uh, before a ball was even kicked before their first match with people saying that they would continue to boo Southgate's team taking the knee. They felt that it was too political and too divisive and that should stay out of football, essentially. Um, and in response, Gareth Southgate stood up and said, no, this is a decision that our players have made and actually made a terribly good um, case and argument for a pride in your country and English nationalism that wasn't based in kind of I think English and maybe British nationalism has been tied up with this kind of like brexit -y view ever since 2015, 2016. There's been quite like a, a narrow view of what it's, it is to be proud of your country. And I was trying to describe it earlier to, to my wife, but I think that the, the past four years, is, the nationalism that's been accepted or the one that we've seen from the people in power is... Well, rah, rah, rah. Britain's great. Don't dwell on the past. We're going to be great and we're going to make a great success of it all. Please, please, please don't mention all the bad stuff we've done. We're not bad. We're really great, actually. Um, and Southgate's view was kind of nuanced and hopeful and said, no, like we, this is a great country and, you know, we take people of all faiths, religions, sexualities. And, but we've got also got to acknowledge that this country can be improved and can do better on that kind of stuff and maybe alarmingly put a greater case for English nationalism and pride in your country um, than Keir Starmer or the leader of the opposition did. Um, and the, as a whole, the way that the England team acted with the media, the way they represented themselves, the way they put themselves forward in interviews, etc. It became a, a team that I could be really proud of, not only because of the results on the pitch, but for how they acted off of it. So that was a really nice feeling for me, to be proud of my country and be, be very proud of a team and to be proud of England in a way that maybe I hadn't been in a while and to have that galvanised by these, these footballers. Um, of course, this taking the knee thing, um, something that Pretty Patel and Boris Johnson both refused to condemn people who booed it, and Pretty Patel even dismissed it as gesture politics right at the start. Um, then as England started to do better and better throughout the tournament, there were more pictures of Pretty Patel wearing an England shirt, cheering the team on. Hooray, I've, I've always supported these boys. And there were various figures on the right who had been really anti-taking the knee, who were suddenly the biggest England fans ever, and people found it disingenuous. And this kind of came to a head when uh, Pretty Patel on June 12th tweeted that I am disgusted that England players who have given so much for our country this summer have been subject to vile racist abuse on social media. There's no place in our country, and I back the police to hold these people responsible. Um, England defender Tyrone Mings responded and said, you don't get to stoke the fire at the beginning of the tournament by labelling our anti-racism message as gesture politics and then pretend to be disgusted when the very thing we're campaigning against happens. And I think it, it's perfectly put, it's very eloquently put by a member of the England football team and does sum up that there were people against taking the knee for a variety of reasons. They felt that BLM was Marxist, but other people were just saying they're taking the knee and Britain's not even racist. Why are they doing it? And then right after this penalty shootout, racist people came out and tweeted these horrible messages. And the problem was very clear to see. And the reason that this team had been taking the knee was all the more apparent. So I feel that that has... What I'm saying is England football team is the new official opposition to the government. That's all I'm saying, I guess. <laughs> Maybe that's what's happened. 
um, as a result of this tool. I don't have much to add other than racism bad, obviously. It's very telling that the effect on Twitter, you don't don't go searching for it. It was all horrible, uh, essentially, <laughs> is the summary of what Twitter was like. And it's like the fact that you can be supporting someone up until they mess up and then suddenly all the racist abuse comes out. And it's like, who are you, man in the pub who hasn't kicked a football in 20 years? Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I, it, it's obviously the racism and, and so on is despicable. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'd argue the position of trying to like jump on the bandwagon from the Conservative Party is also despicable, especially when it's kind of their fault. I mean, I'm not saying all racism is the Conservative Party's fault, but there's definitely a hand in it, as you say, from this kind of Brexit mentality and everything else. You know, no one should be subjected to that. People are attacking people on Twitter over missing a goal in a sports game. Using that kind of language is just not okay. <laughs> Moving on to more great things the Conservatives done. That last headline, Up Your Game, was also kind of directed at Boris Johnson and what they're doing, the Conservatives done to foreign aid. Um, so, so very quickly on this point, just that the Conservative government since the Cameron administration has been determined to have at least 0.7% of GDP going as foreign aid out to other countries. Um, the government basically said they wanted to re remove that restriction and and lessen it somewhat. Um, and this passed in the in the Commons, despite a rebellion of about 35 Conservative MPs, most notable among them, former Prime Minister Theresa May, who was very vocal and even said in her own speech that, you know, she was a Prime Minister with a very small majority and would never have imagined that she'd have to go against her party when there was a three-line whip, basically, that says you must vote for this. Um, she felt that she couldn't, in all good consciousness, vote for it because it was something she didn't agree with. Uh, I've got David Cameron's statement as well, who said that he felt, yes, that it was a grave mistake, um, you know, that we're turning our back on the international community when it is at most need, particularly, you know, loads. It's not just us that's been affected by the COVID pandemic, even though this, this will probably be in the forefront of uh, Rishi Sunak's mind, as, you know, they've spent an awful lot on the COVID pandemic. Um, we need to save, make savings somewhere, and this is one way to do it. Other countries have also been gravely affected, and sometimes the poorest countries have been affected the worst and don't have access to the same health system or support that, that, that we do. So it is a bit of a kick in the teeth then, particularly when you want to, you know, this global Britain message that Boris Johnson has been trying to promote in the wake of Brexit, um, it does undermine that message so somewhat. Um, and the third former Conservative leader to come out against it is uh, John Major, who's, um, I've got the statement there. I don't know if you want to read it out, um, but I feel that this one just really hits the nail on the head of a lot of matters. The government has blatantly broken its word and should be ashamed of its decision. It seems that we can afford a national yacht that no one either wants or needs whilst cutting help to some of the most miserable and destitute people in the world. This is not a conservatism that I recognise. It is the stamp of Little England, not Great Britain. And I think, you know, I probably if I was aware enough at the time to have... I was born during uh, Thatcher's era and I grew up with John Major as the Prime Minister, but I was definitely too young to kind of, you know, understand what was going on. I'm sure I wouldn't agree with him as a conservative then anyway, but I think this is very kind of, it's similar to the pushback against Trumpism in the US where there are, you know, the old school Republicans who push back on what Trump was doing. And I think we have a similar issue here. You know, if most of the previous conservative prime ministers are going, Boris, what are you doing? Um, that's probably, you know, not a good thing for him. Yeah, it's a... Cutting foreign aid is always something that I see as quite a populist move because it's clearly it's something that's like pushed by the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. I know that they've explicitly had campaigns about British aid and cutting it in the past. There are some people who say, why are we sending money overseas when we can't even feed our own kids or look after our own war veterans? We should take the money from that budget and put it into helping our own people budget, um, which I think is a overly simple simplistic way to look at things and often these these former conservative prime ministers can see the good and the international relations that you know you get from spreading the wealth a little bit and at least having that aid stops problems down the line and stops major crises happening down the line that you might have to deal with later on when things have got much worse um but it appears that Johnson is happy to try and take the easy popular route of just saying, hey, no, we'll, we'll cut overseas aid. And he's kind of falling back on the COVID pandemic and the cost that has had to the public purse as a reason for doing it now, saying, oh, we can always get it up later. Well, you know, 
in defense of this, Cameron's decision to have 0.7% of GDP as aid, guess what? When you've been through a COVID pandemic and you're not producing as much GDP, that 07 will be less anyway, because it's a percentage. It's not like a, we're not saying that we're going to give four billion out every year, no matter what. And I think even Theresa May said in her speech... She basically said that people were quibbling over this is four billion that we're saving, but actually we've spent four hundred billion on the COVID pandemic. Oh, there we go. Sorry, yeah. We borrowed four hundred billion. Where are the dire warnings about that? It seems that four billion is really bad news, but four hundred billion, who cares? So that number four billion seems huge when you put it in isolation, but when you compare it to everything else that we've done and we've borrowed and the Conservatives are not freaking out, this doesn't seem to be a fiscally responsive responsible move either. It's not about balancing the books. It appears to be more of like a, a populist trend. And the fact that this has passed is like clearly disappointing, not only for people who are opponents of the Conservative Party, but for people within that party as well. And it might alienate a few. Those voters that voted Lib Dem rather than Conservative in those home counties, I think, again, this is another thing that will uh, maybe push those voters to not vote Conservative next time around, if it, if it is a big um, item on the agenda uh, come the next election. You've kind of hit the nail on the head there. There's a lot of talk about, you know, whether the Conservatives are fiscally responsible and all this kind of stuff. And But it is how you present the numbers. Like you say, you know, people go, oh, four billion, that's a lot of money. But it's not like any of us have four billion. It's the country as a whole that's spending this money. And, you know, they're cutting back on the NHS is part of the reason why dealing with a pandemic has cost us so much, for example, because we suddenly had to funnel a load of money into the NHS, which should have already been there you know, getting rid of preparedness. And it's not just in the UK, but many countries had various pandemic preparedness plans that got like shelved and loads of material was wasted. And it's our usual reminder, I suppose, to look past the numbers, because if someone's giving you a number to try and suggest something, they probably have a reason they're showing you that number. Uh, so always look beyond the number and try and work out how big it is in relation to other things. As you say, if, if we obviously can't pay for every single thing at once because there's not enough money, but where you choose to make those cuts or et cetera, it should not just be because you see a big number of figure in the newspaper. You should have a think about it. I know we spent a while on the headlines this week, uh, but we promised you last time that we would carry on our coverage of the by-elections. So here we are back into Batley and Spen, the by-election we mentioned last time. So do you want to give us a summary of kind of where we were last time? I know for, for our listeners, it was only the last episode, but it's been a few weeks for us. Yeah. So um, we'd had two previous by-elections, one giving the Conservatives a historic win up in Hartlepool. Um, we then had the other one where there was a surprise where the Conservatives were expected to take Chesham and Amersham. Um, but the Lib Dems shocked them by breaking that bit of the blue wall. Uh, and then we were on to Batley and Spen, which was meant to be a conservative. Well, the conservatives were quite positive going into this election, looking at the defeat that Labour had suffered at Hartlepool. They felt that this was another brick in that red wall that they could take and they could really solidify their hold on the North or prove that they could keep winning these seats in the North. So that's like the context. But as always, like by-elections and individual constituencies, they're all very different political animals. And having a look at the the things surround, like the, the factors surrounding this election, maybe should have given us a few warning signs that this wouldn't have been the slam dunk that the Conservatives had in Hartlepool would be a repeat here. So a couple of important things to mention, I guess. Um, one, we touched on it last time, but the Labour MP who was in charge, Tracy Brabin, was elected mayor of West Yorkshire, um, possibly quite a big oversight by Keir Starmer letting her run for that. And the only reason that she ran for it was because she was dismissed from the shadow cabinet. So again, that decision, this was all basically a by-election that was of Starmer's own making, perhaps, and had maybe opened the gates for a polit potential political own goal. Um, so that's a worry. Uh, however, the candidate that he chose to replace her, Kim Leadbeater, um, was considered by quite a few people as a good candidate. She knew the area. She was also the sister of the murdered MP, um, Joe Cox, who had previously represented this constituency. So she clearly had very big ties to the area. Um, so that was the Labour background. The Conservatives were coming in hoping that they could capitalise on that success in Hartlepool and also hoping that the third candidate in this race, George Galloway, would take votes away from Labour. Um, this was a constituency targeted by Galloway, particularly because there is, according to a 2001 census, 
you've got about 16.9% of residents there having a Pakistani heritage. And Galloway has always targeted constituencies that have a very large majority of Muslim people living there, essentially. Um, his politics and the way that he has won votes in the past was based around the Iraq war when he got success. And this time, although his platform is like quite left wing, you definitely call it more to the left wing of Keir Starmer, um, his attacks are basically ones that aim to stir up quite a lot of racial and religious hatred. It's the only way that I can describe it. Like his, his attacks are not that of a traditional MP. So the kind of things that Galloway was bringing up for example, was talking about the Labour leadership and how they're dealing with the Palestinian territories and Israel. He bring up Labour's approach to the Kashmir conflict, which is their stance on it, which is the conflict between India and Pakistan and how that was going on. Um, he even brought up issues of like the suspension of a teacher for showing a school of the Prophet Muhammad in a local grammar school and said that, hey, that was Labour didn't act strongly on this. Um, kind of bringing up factors that wouldn't be a factor at a national level and would usually have very little impact if he was trying to do a national party. Um, but in this area, clearly had a lot of pull and sway over a large amount of the electorate. And this led to some pretty dirty campaigning happening on both sides. In particular, Galloway would accuse Labour of being, you know, of, because Labour supported like LGBT inclusive teaching at schools in Birmingham. And that's something that goes against sort of like traditional Muslim beliefs. There was that conflict that was happening. And this led to a moment where uh, the Labour candidate was chased and heckled by a group of men. That video went viral and it was quite uncomfortable to see, particularly when you're thinking about what happened to that woman's sister four years ago in a campaign that was very highly charged and vicious. We don't we certainly don't look at the campaign of the EU referendum as one of being kind of like hope and soft. I, th I think we've looked back at that as being quite like a, a dirty, nasty campaign. Um, this one had the same hallmarks. The way that Labour tackled these allegations or the way that Labour tackled this front from Galloway also was brought into question. Um, so there was an official Labour Party leaflet with a photo of Boris Johnson with the Indian Prime Minister Modi. Uh, basically, the, the implication there was don't vote for the Conservatives. They're too close to India. You should vote for Labour, who's always supported your Muslim beliefs, which is kind of, again, that's like weird, dirty politics. And particularly, you know, Labour will have a lot of Indian supporters and Hindu supporters throughout the rest of the country. And I believe that the, the publishing of that leaflet led to Labour Friends of India asking them to withdraw that, that leaflet and take it back. And the only other leaflet that was uh, published that was of some controversy, there was one that appeared to be from Labour and had a picture of uh, Keir Starmer taking the knee and basically saying that he wanted to eradicate whiteness from multicultural Britain. Uh, it, was a it was a leaflet that looked like it came from Labour, but didn't have the imprint of any party on it, which means basically it contravenes electoral rules. All of this kind of like dirty tactics, weird leaflets going around, odd and not You'd think these by-elections would be fought on a national level of, like, you'd think they'd be more about the coronavirus pandemic and how that's been handled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It appeared that this was very much not the case in this by-election. So you've got a lot of different factors comparing it to, like, Hartley Paul or Cheshire and Amersham. Um, and it led to a really weird feeling around the campaign, um, as there always is when, when, when George Galloway is involved. Is he, um, although he is an effective campaigner and he's been elected, um, the method in which he gets his votes has always been uh, maybe not the traditional way that you would do it and as many people have called into question his method so, so we've mentioned george galloway a fair bit there and last time i think i i think i maybe dismissed him a little out of hand um because he has had some particularly bad results in recent years um but as you say he kind of goes in with the, these strategies uh that are well i mean I, i'd argue not okay uh but yeah it has clearly paid High, off. highly targeted yeah 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 clearly paid off as he managed to get 21.9 percent of the vote which is a lot more than i was expecting him to get it's interesting because you look at 
the uh, percentages and Labour came down 7.4%, the Conservatives down 1.6%. So Labour still wins, Kim Ledbetter still wins. But I was having a look through actually trying to work out where the other votes came from. Um, and I think it's one of those confusing things where uh, <laughs> none of these charts is particularly helpful because the change in the majority and the way they do the percentages looks a bit weird. Um, but there were, as with most by-elections, there were a lot of uh, people in this who like took small parts of the main percentage. Um, but George Galloway was the runaway out of those. I mean, getting eight, nearly eight times what the Lib Dems got, who lost about a percent as well. Um, so yeah, he certainly had an effect on this election, uh, even with the turnout down by almost twenty percent. So yeah, I spoke. You know, as I say, I predicted wrong. I always hold my hands up when I get something wrong. Um, Obviously, I think it's good that Kim won, given given you know the situation there. Uh, as you say, a lot of horrible things. Um, one thing I hadn't realised because uh, I've I've looked up Kim's uh, page. Uh, we're now going to end up with two pictures of her face in the chat because she won the by election. So it's the same like picture they have of her. I'm sure at some point she will get a new MP photograph, which will be used on the Wikipedia pages. But she is uh, she is an, another LGBT member of Parliament, which is great. Um, so that's good. Uh, but obviously that adds an extra kind of horrificness to the fact that she was being chased around by these men who are against like LGBT teaching in schools. Um, yeah, I mean, that's horrible. Uh, and again, I don't think we need to say that it's horrible. Uh, it just is. Overall result, Labour just win by 300 or so votes. Galloway's inclusion in this election, where he's had his most success in the past, is taking votes away from Labour because traditionally BAME voters have voted for Labour in the past in general. But what Galloway tends to come in is come in as left of that and stirring up all of this stuff on like religious and ethnic lines, particularly in these places that have a lot of Muslim voters and will take a proportion away from the Labour vote. And it was the Conservative hope that he would take enough away for them to step in and, and win the election. Um, as it happened, that clearly wasn't the case. Um, some people were even worried that maybe Galloway's tactics, were, although he is economically very left-wing, but quite socially conservative, may have caused some people who voted conservative back in 2019 to change their vote to Galloway, and that might have undermined the conservative chances of success. I think another big factor at this election, which, you know, we're talking about comparing by elections and where certain trends happened. In Hartlepool, you had a look at the 2019 result and there was a big lot of votes for um, the Brexit party. Um, and when you had a look at where Labour had lost those votes or where the Conservatives, most importantly, had gained those votes, essentially 80 to 90 percent of those Brexit party voters moved over to the Conservative Party. And that was enough to bump them way up over Labour, who lost votes in the 2021 election. If you have a look at the 2019 and previous result, the Brexit party Party only picked up around about 1,678 votes. So not enough for the Conservatives to make a significant gain. Essentially, if you added those votes to the Conservatives' total last election, they still would have lost in Batley and Spen. So they needed this Galloway factor and hoped that that would take enough votes away from Labour to help them win it. As it turned out, it wasn't enough to push them over the line. Um, the other thing that we haven't mentioned that might have undermined the Conservatives' chance of a victory here, and you, you kind of see it in the polling of 2021, and I can't remember the exact date that our last episode went out, but uh, if you think back to our last episode, we just recorded it, we sat down and went, oh, that's good. Really hope no kind of like big government scandal happens between the time that we actually publish this episode. Um, and then we all had that terrible moment where we wanted to rip our eyes out because the health secretary, Matt Hancock, was caught on camera groping um, somebody who definitely wasn't his wife um, in uh, his private cabinet offices. And that essentially after weeks of pressure on Hancock to try and make him resign over various COVID-related scandals, it was odd that the thing that finally brought him down was the reveal of that affair um, and the possible wrongdoings that that, you know, the possible ethical questions that brought up, particularly with the fact that the person he was having this affair with wasn't just an aide, but was kind of his boss and kind of like responsible for assessing his job performance, particularly at like a very small level within government, um, even though you could argue that the general public is responsible for judging Matt Hancock's job performance. Um, she was at least one of the people who would report back to the government on those matters. That general level of like sleaze and bad press that put on the government over that week might have been enough to 
push that very, very slim majority that Labour earned might have gone the other way for the Conservatives if some people hadn't floated away because of that scandal that was coming out. Uh, so a lot of it's, it's always really hard to pinpoint one particular factor in these by-elections, particularly when we've already touched on a multitude of like cultural and historical factors that are all tied up in this one constituency. If you think of everything I've mentioned, it seems like a lot has happened here compared to my own one. I, I, I feel I, you know, I feel fairly confident in, in saying that. Um, the fact that Labour were able to win and squeak this one out as a win, I think, came as a as a shock to maybe both political commentators and the party itself. Uh, there had been a lot of talk before this, particularly from one prominent Guardian journalist, um, Owen Jones, who basically came out and said, if Keir Starmer loses badly in Spain, he should resign because it's clear that Labour can't win in the North anymore. Um, and the fact that they did kind of took the wind out of everyone's, everybody was kind of preparing to run those pieces on, oh, Keir Starmer's in trouble, should he resign? In fact, that Labour were able to win it means that those stories have kind of been put on the back burner. But the fact that they still had a very much reduced number of votes in that constituency, the fact that it was so narrow, I don't think, I think Labour are cautious of calling this as a massive victory for them either. I think the main sense in that constituency is just one of relief, relief that it's over, relief that they got that candidate in. Um, and for the Conservatives, maybe a little bit of concern that they weren't able to capitalise on the success that they'd had in the North. And I think this is a big, a big warning sign to, after Hartlepool and the way those votes went, I think a lot of people in the Labour Party were really like, oh my goodness me, we're going to lose so many seats in the red wall now. This is just, the writing is on the wall. This is, this is done. We've really got some troubles in our constituencies if we don't turn it around, particularly with Keir Starmer as our leader, who seems unable to connect with that type of voter. Um, this kind of shows the, maybe the limit of where the Conservatives can go and that there are some seats that will always kind of be safely Labour. At least they don't have to worry about at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's been very interesting to see three by-elections go three differently, completely different ways over the course of about a month or two. Um, when you can, you we always expect politics to be relatively stable during that time. It certainly seemed like quite a shift, both locally and nationally. Um, so I know one thing we kind of touched on as we were talking about this, especially with the the Tory loss in Amersham and Chesham, was whether you know are there are there significant shifts because we we've seen some shifts due to like the Brexit effect. And the question now is, are those shifts? permanent is the makeup of which constituencies will vote one way or the other significantly changing across the country as there's a shift shift you know we talk about the red wall the blue wall are those going to last or is it as a bbc article we'll throw in the show notes uh, suggests that politics might be starting to return to normal whatever that is <laughs> um i think yeah i'm i'm going to agree with the bbc article kind of uh, those those brexit shifts that happened in hartlepool i think should still be a massive worry for labor um anywhere whether anywhere that they have a look at an mp that got in because the brexit party took a significant amount of votes away from the conservatives in 2019 um they should be worried about those voters having now gone over to the conservative party because i think as anna sobri said the other day a former conservative mp she said the Conservative Party is now the Brexit Party, basically. She believes that they have moved right enough or that Johnson's populism is at that stage where they very much appeal to Brexit Party voters now. Um, so that should still be a worry for Labour. Uh, however, that Hartlepool election was kind of in a weird place where vaccine rollout was going well. We were happy about that. There wasn't... The government seemed in like a weirdly good place and... It's been it's been very tough for Starmer during COVID times because I think people have people have underestimated the capacity for the average voter to be like, hey, I know that our government got a lot of things wrong during this pandemic. PPE for the, the amount of PPE locking down too slowly, et cetera, et cetera. However, I feel a lot of voters believe that Labour, if they were in power, would have faced very similar challenges or maybe perform maybe not performed better on that, just the same, because we live through extraordinary times. And Johnson has very much been a proponent of, we don't want any party politics during this time. We basically don't want any opposition because we've all got to get into together and get through this crisis. Um, and he's made a lot of Keir Starmer carping on from the sidelines or being Mr. Hindsight, like those are his ways. 
and he's trying to portray Labour as trying to make a fuss when actually we should just get our head down, get on with it and get through this crisis. Um, so that's all good for Johnson while COVID is still very much a thing and happening. Uh, <coughs> and although I know we started the start of this um, podcast by saying, hey, COVID isn't going anywhere for a while, be careful. Um, but certainly as things start to get towards more of like a normality where COVID isn't dominating the main headlines or isn't becoming... Um, the main story, much like, hey, I think it's fair to say Brexit isn't the main story anymore. Um, we've definitely, the, the, politi the political conversation has moved away from that issue a lot. Uh, the reason Brexit party voters are going over to the Conservatives, I think, is more of like a, a cultural thing now rather than actually on the issue of Brexit. But maybe we can get to that issue in more depth later. Um, but as things, as COVID starts to wind down, then people will start looking at politics in the traditional political light. The vaccine bounce won't matter for Johnson in the same way. They'll start to judge him on things like international aid for example, or how he performs at the G20. And um, he did a speech today on his levelling up agenda, which I haven't listened to in full, but all the commentary I heard on it from both neutral and supportive of the Conservatives and not so supportive seemed to suggest that he had um, nothing to say, but spent a lot of time saying it, um, which, is, which is worrying for the Conservatives. If they've got these big flagship policies that actually don't come to anything, voters will start to notice and voters will start to go into their traditional like lines, essentially. Those, those Labour red wall seats might become stronger red wall seats because they're less worried about those COVID things going on and less wanting to reward the government for their efforts through that. They might fall back into the traditional politics. So yes, I think three by-elections all spread out. I think the Conservative victory came at the perfect time for the Conservatives where they were in the polls. And then the next two have kind of shown where ah, there's still very much a weakness to being the party in power for 11 years whilst you're in a by-election. Um, that Hartlepool result made me feel like we were going to have Conservative governments for the next 10 years, that the Labour Party couldn't recover from this. And oh my goodness, where are, the con where are Labour going to get their next win? I just couldn't see it happening. After Batley and Spen, it's kind of made me refocus and go, ah, no, you can't read, you can't read too much into by-elections. After spending three episodes on them, here's my conclusion. You can't read too much into by-elections. It's all very much down to like individual factors, but it does kind of read, it shows this narrative of uh, the Conservatives being at their highest point, but clearly very wary and they can't just glide on this success for ages. Um, and in fact, quite quickly, maybe by the end of the year, but certainly by the time the next election rolls around, the issues that we're discussing today, today around COVID will have gone but the old traditional divides will very much remain. And it's uh, if the Conservatives can live past that time of Brexit not being on Brexit, not being a major factor and COVID not being a major factor. What else do they have to that bow? Can they still maintain that support or, or will it gradually fade over time? I suppose kind of following on from that as a prediction from you to round out the podcast. Do you feel like as those things are becoming history as opposed to current topics, like if we're predicting ahead again to future elections. How do you feel the general impression of the public? Because we said there was like a COVID bounce, right? And, you know, Brexit has obviously helped the Conservatives as well in previous elections. So do, do you think that's a thing where the effect will just die off? Or do you think it's something where, you know, the people who are already voting for them based on those things are going to say, well, they did well. So that's a good track record when, when it comes to the next election. Or is it just way too far in the future to predict? Um, oh, it's probably way too far in the future to predict. And I would be a fool to do so. But here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's why I like asking this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Um, I think I think a lot of it comes down to their leader and how Johnson reacts. So you look at, you, I looked at some polls that came out in the past two days and one showed like quite a big dip in the Conservatives and the majority of those people moving to like the Lib Dems or Green um, instead. And another one showed the Conservatives as basically holding their current polling of 43%. Of 43% would definitely be enough to win them the next election. The reason the Conservatives can go into the next election feeling quite strongly about it is that Labour are particularly in the wilderness at the moment. Um, Keir Starmer has found it very difficult to be in opposition throughout this crisis. And whereas Jeremy Corbyn was divisive amongst a large amount of the population, he at least had some enthusiasm behind him. Keir Starmer seems to very much be suffering from nobody appears to like him very much, both on the left or the right or the centre of his party. 
Uh, however, Labour also has nobody who is currently an MP that they can turn to um, to fill that leadership void, uh, essentially. So the Conservatives can kind of maybe feel safe in that aspect. However, I think <laughs> it seems dumb to, to say this, but I, th I feel that the points that were raised by like the England footballers and Gary Neville around like the, the feeling that I had after the Euros and the points that were put across by those people who were very, you know, that the England footballers are very popular amongst a large amount of the population and they were really able to highlight some of the hypocrisy at the top levels of government when pitted against things like Johnson's very good at scoring own goals as well. And the more focus is put on Johnson as uh, being a liability for his party rather than an asset, that's the one thing that might change. Like, I think the Conservatives without Boris Johnson might stand a better chance of winning the next next election rather than with him. Um, although he was very much seen as an electoral success in 2019, I'm very curious to see if he can take that on to 2024 or if his brand will be forever damaged by his time in, in charge. So yeah, so I feel the longer that Johnson is in charge and the more he's scrutinised, the more his kind of appeal will die down. It's it, Comparisons have been made to Trump because of his appearance and because of their populism. And I feel Trump had a similar issue when he came into like running for his second term. Um, people voted for Trump because he was an unknown factor and popular and, hey, he might do something different. And I feel that was kind of a factor behind the Johnson election as well. People voted for him thinking, hey, is that fun bloke off the telly? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll vote for him. He might shake things up. But the more he's in charge and the more eyes you get on him and the more things that he fails to deliver on or promise on, it makes it very difficult for him to get re-elected on that same platform when he's been the one in charge and, and nothing has changed. Um, so if Labour were to find another leader by 2024 and Johnson was still in charge, I think that's a different election entirely. I think Johnson versus Starmer, the Conservatives win. Johnson versus another Labour person, I'll say Andy Burnham because he's the flavour of the month, but very much should be reminded he is not an MP. He's a Metro mayor. There is no um, there are no by-elections in which he can get voted into at the moment, so he can become an MP, so he cannot be the leader of that party. Um, but maybe Johnson against a more popular Labour leader, it's a very different question. Um, so there we go. I've, I've answered your question by not answering it and giving you both possible both possible outcomes. But I feel those are the, like, those are, those are the main defining factors behind it. No, no, I understand that. And I think, uh, you know, it's always hard to predict anything. And we all know how polls narrow just before an election, etc. So giving any kind of prediction. But I, I think it is interesting because, you know, last time we spoke, we were all like, well, this is the new normal of our politics. And so answering that question of whether this is a new status quo or whether things could shift, I think was important. Um, so as always, Rob, thank you for your insight and coming and telling me a lot more about politics than I personally know. Um, as I always say, you can find us on all of the socials at Unpal Podcast or forward slash r forward slash unparliamentary if you're on Reddit um, and as unparliamentary language on Facebook. If you enjoyed this and you want access to bonus content, we always record a kind of little intro thing for the episode where Rob and I talk about life and what we've been doing, how we've been wittering away, uh, sorry, how we've been frittering away our spare time in the pandemic, things like that. Uh, that's over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TTSS, where you can throw a minimum of a dollar our way. Uh, to support the podcast and you also get access to bonus content from other podcasts uh, as uh, you would know if you were listening to that episode i recently did a special with the astrocast which is our games workshop uh, kind of news podcast that's run by brad so make sure to check them out uh, they don't have an advert yet out of our various adverts we throw at the end of the episode so that's an ad for them uh, go listen to them that they'd just been talking about Games Workshop for a long time now, and they gave me a lot of information about where where things are in the latest special. Um, and there's two more of those coming out over the summer, so uh, make sure to check them out. Um, and after saying all of that, I think there's nothing left for me to say other than it's good night from me. And it's good night from me. Bye. 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 Bye.